Good afternoon and Merry Christmas Eve. Welcome to St. Mary's. Today's Mass celebrates the Christmas Vigil and our celebrant this afternoon will be Father Hines. We ask that you please turn off all cell phones and any electronic devices during the Mass and please join me and our St. Mary's Youth Choir in our opening hymn, which is number 92, O Come All Ye Faithful, number 92. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. to 
We adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, heavenly King, O oh God, Almighty Father, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace on earth, peace to people of good will. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand, the right hand of the Father, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who gladden us year by year as we wait in hope for our redemption, grant that just as we joyfully welcome your only begotten Son as our Redeemer, we may also merit to face him confidently when he comes again as our judge, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. For Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. Until her vindication shines forth like the dawn and her victory like a burning torch. Nations shall behold your vindication and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name pronounced by the mouth of the Lord. You shall be a glorious crown in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem held by your God. No more shall people call you forsaken or your land desolate, but you shall be called my delight and your land espoused. For the Lord delights in you and makes your land his spouse. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. The word of the Lord. Forever I will sing the goodness of the showed the greatness of your love by covenant you chose us as your own until the end of time forever i will say the goodness of the lord oh how 
blessed are they who can know the joyous grace that come from praising you, my Lord. At your very name, how they rejoice. And in your justice, you will raise them up. Their hearts reflect your love. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Paul reached Antioch in Pisidia and entered the synagogue, he stood up, motioned with his hand, and said, Fellow Israelites, and you others who are God-fearing, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors and exalted the people during their sojourn in the land of Egypt. With uplifted arm, he led them out of it. Then he removed Saul and raised up David as king. Of him he testified, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my every wish. From this man's descendants, God, according to his promise, has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. John heralded his coming by proclaiming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was completing his course, he would say, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. Behold, one is coming after me. I am not worthy to unfasten the sandals of his feet. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly since he was a righteous man. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her until she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Two things to start. First, it's very good to see some of you. 
It's really good to see all of you, some of you in particular. Some of you I haven't seen for perhaps a couple of months, maybe a few more months than that, or a little bit longer. But it's really great to have you here with us. A point of note about this particular gospel passage. Oftentimes you'll hear that it is said, well, you know, Jesus had brothers and sisters, and sometimes they'll point to this passage of the gospel. And they'll say, look, right here, it says that Joseph had no relations with Mary until she bore a son. But we have to keep in mind that the way that we use words is not always the same way in which words were used by the Greeks or in the early days when the New Testament was written. Elsewhere, we hear this word until, 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 until. And when we use it in the English language, we think, okay, until, so which means until something and then something else happens. In other words, Joseph had no relations until, and so he must have had relations with Mary afterwards. Well, this is not what the early Christians believed. This is not, in fact, what occurred. We see this word until, and we imply something that is not there. Elsewhere, we find in the Psalms, it said that we look to the eyes of the Lord until he have mercy upon us. But this is not to say that as if we only look to the Lord until he has mercy upon us, and then we can go off and do whatever we want. No, rather, the word until does something very important. The way that it's used in these ancient languages is to emphasize something very important. When it's used in the Psalms, when it is said that our eyes look to the Lord until he have mercy upon us, it is to say that we look intently upon the Lord. And when we hear this phrase here, it is to say that, Jesus, that Joseph absolutely, without a doubt, without any shadow of a doubt, had any relations with Our, our Lady. This is not to imply anything other than that. Our Lady, of course, as we will say in the Creed tonight, right after the homily, after the uh, homily, when we say the prayers, uh, uh, before we say the prayers of the faithful, when we recite the Creed together, we will say the always ever Virgin Mary. But when we do, when we say the words, and the Lord became, and the Word became flesh, we are going to kneel tonight. Because tonight we celebrate not just any Mass, as though any Mass in particular was less important, but that we celebrate today the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the question becomes for us, why would we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ? This is, of course, a historical action, something that happened 2,000 years ago, and it's something that we continue to live in day by day. We even use a specific phrase, Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. For when certain events occur in history, they change everything. Now, sometimes you're going to hear, because the secular world does not like you. I'll be honest with you. The secular world does not like Catholics. I'm going to be very clear. They would love to erase Christianity from all of the world. They would love to see it gone. And they've been trying to do this for, in fact, 2,000 years. And we start seeing this precisely where? in language. That is why it is so important for us to be very attentive to language. We do not put 1,999. We do not put 2,021 BCE, for we do not live or before the common era or after the common era. These are not Christian ways of thinking. And in fact, even if they were, what a strange thing to think. What changed 2,000 years ago? What great historical act said that we are going to mark our days from this very moment? It is precisely this, what we celebrate today, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why would we do that? Why would such an event be so important? Could it be that there was a certain event that we had been waiting for for a long time, that in particular the Jews, the Israelites, have been waiting for many, many, many years? Our Lady would have been waiting in that very moment when the angel Gabriel came and appeared to her and said, you will conceive a son and you will name him Jesus because he will be God is with you. She would have known what that meant because the Jews were waiting precisely for that redemption, precisely for that salvation. But we have to ask ourselves, are we waiting for salvation? Have we forgotten what it means to be saved? There is a danger, of course, as we hear it very often frequently said, that, you know, especially after someone dies, oh, we're all going to heaven. 
we're all going to go to heaven. This is a beautiful sentiment. It's a wonderful idea. But it is not what our Lord promises us in the Gospels. It's as though, you know, we watch the movie, all dogs go to heaven, and we apply it to ourselves. Our Lord desires that each and every single one of us who is here present in this church indeed go to heaven. But our Lord is a perfect gentleman, and he will not force his graces upon any one of us. So we have to ask ourselves, what does salvation mean? What does it mean to be redeemed, and why do we celebrate it year after year after year? Maybe we don't think much about salvation. Maybe we think, I'm okay, you're okay, let's just be nice people together. Well, that's a wonderful idea. It's a wonderful sentiment, and we should be nice to each other. In fact, that's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Generosity, kindness, patience. All of these things come from living a Christian, Catholic life. But oftentimes we don't think about our own salvation. Why should we care about our salvation, however? Because we care about something else. We care in particular about our happiness. This is why we go out and we do the things that we do. We take the recreation that we do. Maybe you like to, in the summer, you go out camping. Maybe you go out boating. Maybe in the winter, you go out skiing or you take your friends and your family out ah, to somewhere warm so you don't have to endure these cold New England winters. We are always searching for happiness. The reality is that our happiness is deeply tied to our salvation because our unhappiness is to, tied to precisely that thing that, lead, that leads us away from our salvation. In other words, our unhappiness is deeply tied to the question of sin. Now, there's a, a song that I've heard in the past that says that, you know, all of us want to go to heaven, but none of us want to die. In a certain sense, all of us want to be saved, but none of us want to recognize that there is something that we need to be saved from. Our Lord did not come into the world to simply tell us that we are good people. He came in the world that he might become our savior. One of the things that the Greek philosophers often tell us when they talk about happiness is they say, call no man happy until he is dead. Call no man happy until he has died. Now, why would we say this? Why would the Greeks say this? They say it because they recognize something very important about this life. This life is constantly changing, constantly moving along. And the person who seems like he's at the very top, seems like he's got everything, could all of a sudden fall from grace. How many times have we seen this with actors, politicians, with so many of the famous men and women of our time and throughout history, of course, as well? Call no man blessed until he has died. In other words, call no man happy until he has died. For this Greek word, makarios, can be translated as happy as well as blessed. How many of us desire this in our hearts? We want to be blessed. We want to be happy. We want it so deeply. This is one of the reasons why there are so many movies made. All these different romantic comedies, even the rom-coms themselves. I don't watch very many of them, as you probably imagine. I don't have somebody who's constantly needling me in the arm to watch, make me watch the latest one. There's so many of these movies out there because we want that heavenly, we want that happily ever after. And even the guys who are sitting here thinking, I don't watch the rom-coms. We know you do, by the way. I don't watch the rom-coms. I watch the action movies. Well, there's something there to be said to you, too. Those movies, they make you feel like you're the hero, like you're the savior, like you're the one who's going to bring peace to the world because that's what we want. We want peace and we want happiness. This is why our Lord is called the Prince of Peace. This is why our Lord is called the Savior and the Redeemer. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Because in our very hearts, our Lord has placed a desire for happiness, and it will not be extinguished. It can only grow. We can hide it. We can pretend that it doesn't exist. We can try and wash it away through all the various distractions that are out there in the world. We can do this in perhaps good ways, healthier ways. Maybe we can be like some people who exercise so much, they try to forget about what they've been doing. They go off and they're distracted by all the things. Perhaps more frequently, though, we sit down and we watch Netflix after over and over and over and over again. Or maybe we have a couple drinks. Maybe we work too much. Maybe we find anything that can distract us from that very chronic feeling. Some of us here, maybe many of us, if not all of us, right, at the end of the night when we think, what is it all about? 
as our head hits the pillow, we wonder, why are we doing this? What is the meaning of life? If we look back, we realize that we are not alone in asking these questions for those same philosophers who asked, who wondered, who said we should not call no man, we should call no man happy until he is dead. Those too, they wondered. One of the things that's very interesting about the ancient world is that the ancients knew that they were sinful men and women. This is why they had so many of these different gods, right? They had all of these altars that set up that they would try to offer these sacrifices to make propitiation, to make reparation in a certain sense. And even the Jews, our forefathers in the faith, even the Israelites themselves did the same thing. And we read in the Gospels, we read in the Old Testament. Our Lord himself says that our forefathers offered oblations and sacrifices, sin offerings, which could not save. And so our Lord decided that he would come down and he would be here with us. No man is happy until he is dead. The basic premise is that happiness cannot be found in this world. For this world is fleeting. And if we put our faith in things that are constantly changing, we put our faith in sandcastles that will crumble to the ground even as we desire to grab and take hold of them as the sand falls beneath our fingers, between our fingers. Our happiness cannot be found in passing things. So many of you who are here today are married. A wonderful, great gift. Our Lord desired that there would be marriage between a man and a woman from the very beginning, and this is why he made Adam and Eve, and that when he came, he performed his first miracle at a wedding. It's a great good, but it is not the greatest of goods. How many of you men and women here who are married thought perhaps on your wedding day, this is going to be it. This is what's going to make me happy. Only to discover that that happiness is fleeting, that the rom-com happily ever after is just as fleeting too, that if we do not place our trust, our hope in something that is firm, then we will find ourselves blown away. We will find ourselves moved along with every current of fad in the world. Our hearts, St. Augustine has this beautiful phrase, and perhaps you've heard it before. St. Augustine says that our hearts are restless, and they will not rest until they rest in you, O Lord, because every time they try to rest on something else, it moves and flutters away. Heraclitus, that great ancient philosopher, said that everything is always constantly moving. And he was right in a certain sense. But what he did not understand, what he did not know, who he did not know was the person of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes it's said that for addicts, they have to get to the very bedrock. They have to get to rock bottom before they change, rock bottom before they can start again. But this is so true for all of us in our lives of faith. We need to get to rock bottom. We need to say, my happiness cannot be found here in this life. And when we get to rock bottom, praise God. Because that's where we can build something. Some of you here might be architects. Some of you might work in construction. You know that we need a solid and firm foundation. And what is the greatest foundation except for God himself? Aristotle, thousands of years ago, said that God is the unmoved mover. He is that which has no beginning or end. And if we place our foundation, if we place our happiness in him, then we can be assured of that. This is the great gift of faith. This is the great gift that follows upon faith, the gift of hope. Because when we place our hope in something that does not pass away, our hope is firm. And this is why the church gives us Christmas. Not just simply so that we can celebrate a historical fact, something that happened 2,000 years ago when our Lord, desiring that we should know him in the very flesh, came down and dwelt among us, born of a virgin. We celebrate the fact that we are foolish. I am foolish. That we are forgetful human persons. That very quickly those distractions of the world, whatever they might be, begin to pull us away little by little by little by little. And we need reminders. That's why we have Advent. That's why we have Christmas. That's why we have Epiphany. That's why we have Lent. That's why we have Easter. Because each and every single one of these shakes us a little bit. 
And it helps us remember this life. Yes, this life. This is not where I'm supposed to put my hope. Every single time we have a little argument with a spouse, every single time we have problems with our children, every single time we have difficulties with our work, these should also be reminders for us. Because we don't want those things. Our hearts want happiness. Our hearts want peace. Our, haps, our hearts want joy. And praise the Lord Jesus Christ because he wants to give it to you. You know, a few years ago, my mother turned 70. I'm sure she's watching this, or if she's not watching it now, she will watch it eventually. My mother turned 70, and for her birthday, she gathered all of us together. Now, normally at a birthday, you do what everybody else does, right? Especially if it's the birthday of one of your parents. You go and give her a gift. Well, we didn't really bring any gifts. My mother doesn't want anything. Instead, something very odd happened. My mother gave us rosaries. My mother's greatest desire for me, my mother's greatest desire for all of her children is that they be happy. This, although I'm not the pastor, this is my greatest desire for each and every single one of you. If I could give you each and every single one of you a rosary, I'm sure many of you already have one, but I hope you pray it. My desire for you is that you find happiness. And my knowledge is that only Christ satisfies. All of you who are here, who are baptized men and women, you have been given something very precious in your baptism. But you have also been given a guarantee. However, because of your baptism, you cannot find happiness anywhere else. In fact, even those who are unbaptized still cannot find true happiness unless they find that happiness in Jesus Christ. As St. Augustine said 1,600 years ago, our hearts will not rest until they rest in the Lord. And this is my desire for you. Now, the challenge for us, especially if perhaps we've been away from the Lord for a little while, perhaps it's been some time, maybe it's been a year since we've come to Mass. Or maybe the last time we went to Mass was Easter or a funeral or a wedding. Praise God. It's so good for you to be in those places. But our Lord Jesus Christ desires to pour himself out to you more and more and more and more. For those of us who have been away from the church for some time, he gives us a great sacrament. He gives us a sacrament of reconciliation, reconciliation, the sacrament of confession, where we take all of our burdens, all of those things, and we lay them down, not at the feet of the priest, although he is there. We lay them down at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there our Lord gives us a great gift. Our Lord begins to give us himself. Every single time when we are restored to faith in Jesus Christ after we have committed some serious sin or after it's been such a long time since we have gone to confession, that is a Christmas day for us. That is a day in which our Lord Jesus Christ is born again in our own hearts and we should rejoice on that day even as we rejoice today. But it does not end there. Christ does not just want to restore us to relationship with him, but he wants to draw us in deeper relationship. And we do this through prayer. Every single Tuesday night we have here at St. Mary's adoration and confession. Every single Tuesday night we have the great opportunity to sit, kneel, stand, whatever, prostrate, our, prostrate ourselves in front of the Lord, adoring him, hidden in the Eucharist. And if we don't know how to pray, it's there that the Lord will teach us. It's there that the Lord will slowly give himself to us little by little. But we have to do it by extending our arms, opening our hands, because our Lord will not force himself upon us. And so we go to confession. We go and we spend time in prayer. We go to Mass. We examine our conscience well, and we ask ourselves, am I ready to receive the Lord? And if indeed we are, if we look upon our souls and we do not see any serious sin, we go and we receive our Lord hidden in the Eucharist, and our Lord does what he promises to do. He gives himself to us, and for those of us who are willing and ready to receive him fully, we receive a great joy. For our Lord, our Savior, has come to us. Christmas Day happened 2,000 years ago in the flesh when our Lord Jesus Christ was born to a virgin in the town of Bethlehem. But that Christmas Day can occur every single day for each and every single one of us when we receive the Eucharist greatly, worthily, purely like Our Lady. For on those days when we receive the Eucharist, our Lord is born again to us. And this is what we seek. Maybe we don't say in so many words that we seek salvation. 
Maybe we don't even often acknowledge that we are seeking happiness. Right? We do this all the time. Sometimes it's at the bottom of a Haggadah's container, sometimes at the bottom of something else. Whatever it might be, everything we do, we're always seeking for happiness. But if we choose things that fall short of the infinite, the best, the greatest, God himself, we will always fall short. So this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to find our happiness, to lay ourselves down so that our Lord might raise us up. Confession, Holy Mass, daily prayer, acts of charity and mercy. So my brothers and sisters, my invitation to you this Christmas if it has been a long time since you have gone to confession, if it has been a long time since you have gone to Holy Mass, come back. We miss you. I miss you. The Lord misses you. The greatest question you have to ask yourself is, if it's been many years, if you're afraid of confession, if you're afraid of Mass, what have you got to lose? very little, but what have you got to gain? Happiness, joy, salvation, eternal life? To me, when put in those terms, the answer is simple. The answer is, of course, Jesus Christ, born to us again and anew each time we receive him. Today, please stand. Today, as we recite the creed in honor and remembering the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do not bow at the words, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, but rather we will kneel. In this way, we make a great act of adoration for our Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With great confidence, knowing that God hears our prayers, we lift our petitions to him. for the priests who make it possible for us to celebrate our Catholic faith. We also remember in a special way our priests of the Archdiocese of Boston who have gone home to the Lord this past year. May our good and loving God grant them an eternal resting place in heaven. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who live in poverty, may our Savior and King, born in a stable, Raise them up through faith to share in the riches of the kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in our faith community who mourn or suffer loneliness, may they find the joy of Christmas through the generosity extended by others. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died in the light of Christ, may they rest in his eternal peace 
especially Arthur Viennes, members of our Mass Intention Guild and all our beloved deceased, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those needs best spoken in the silence of our hearts. For those needs, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, our sole source of happiness, joy, we ask you to hear these prayers that they might grant us the graces we need to follow you, who lives and reigns with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Today, our collection goes to benefit the Clergy Trust of the Archdiocese of Boston. As I mentioned in my homily, I don't have a wife who needles me to watch rom-coms, but that's also uh, an important reminder because I don't have a family of my own in particular to take care of me in my future old age. And so we rely upon the generosity of the parishioners here, even as we have priests who are 75, 80, or even older who are in need of care. So we, brother priests, through your generosity, manage these funds so that they can be well prepared for in their old age. And so although they might not have spouses, they indeed have many children through all of you. So we uh, thank you very much for your generosity in donating to the clergy fund this evening through your collection. Our offertory hymn is number 108, The First Noel, featuring solos by Charlotte, Ellie, and Catherine. Number 108. The first Noel. Brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we look forward, O Lord, to the coming festivities, may we serve you all the more eagerly for knowing that in them you make manifest the beginnings of our redemption. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for in the mystery of the Word made flesh, a new light of your glory has shone upon the eyes of our minds so that as we recognize in him God made visible, we may be caught up through him in love of things invisible. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory. As without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna. Most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Sean, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offered for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. Celebrating the most sacred night on which Blessed Mary, the Immaculate Virgin, brought forth the Savior for this world, and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John, and Paul, Cosmas, and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers and all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and count among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, 
the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants, and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, in all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. 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 At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father who art in heaven, We pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. communion hymn is number 82, Angels We Have Heard on High, featuring solos by Madeline, Tessa, and Evan. Number 82, Angels We Have Heard on High. Next hymn is number 76, Night of Silence and Silent Night. in the 
Our next hymn is O Holy Night, a solo by Emma. Let us pray. <clears throat> Grant, O Lord, we pray that we may draw new vigor from celebrating the nativity of your only begotten Son, by whose heavenly mystery we receive both food and drink, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A challenge to all of you. I am going to put myself in the confessional box at the back of the church. For those of you who would like to go to confession, I would be more than happy to hear your confession that today might be for you indeed a Christmas day in which Christ is born in you in your hearts. But if you fail to take the challenge today, know that St. Mary's has confessions from 6 to 7 on Tuesday nights and from 2.45 to 3.45 on Saturday afternoons. We hope to see you again, and I look forward to meeting all of you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Our recessional hymn is number 102, Go Tell It on the Mountain, with a solo by Ellie. Number 102. Shepherds feared it. 
Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you. 